Picture like playing picture net, picture net. No, that's the drawing one. Air hug. But you can talk in an air hug. It's okay. Hey, good to see you guys. Um, grab your Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 2. Oh, I was told I have to dismiss the youth. So youth, you are, oh, and kids, children and youth, you guys are all dismissed. Everybody else turn to Revelation chapter 2. And we have a big text today, a long text. I, I have probably too many notes. I have to ask for your grace in advance today. But, um, but everything I think is important. I just want to echo quickly um, what Susie said about Easter. We are so excited. It's coming right up. Next week is Palm Sunday. And then the week after that is the, the first weekend of um, April. And we're into Easter. So anyway, we, uh, like we said, be on the lookout for different things on social media that you can share and forward and like and whatever you do on social media with that kind of stuff. And then also um, there'll be an, uh, like an e-invitation that will come to your inbox if you're on our church mailing list. And that would be a great thing you could forward on, um, whether you're inviting someone to come in person and join you or whether you're inviting them just to tune in uh, to our live stream. Uh, we'd love to have them any way that we can have them. So uh, let's pray and just ask the Lord to bless. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 2, finishing up that chapter this morning, looking at verses 18 through 29, but before we do that, we want to ask the Lord to, uh, to bless that. So, Father, we thank you so much for this morning, and we do pray, Lord, as we go to your word, uh, Lord, that you would be our teacher today, Father, that the, the teaching ministry of your spirit would be manifest here this morning, Lord, that as we pray each and every time we open your word, that you would give us ears to hear what your spirit would say to your church, Lord, and we ask it uh, on behalf of of our local church, Lord. We ask it on behalf of the corporate church, Lord. We ask it on behalf of us each, uh, Lord, as individual members of your church. Speak to us, we pray. Um, bless your word, Lord, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're looking at, you know, these seven letters to these seven churches. And Jesus had specifically selected these churches in Asia, and he's speaking to them about the different things which are important to him, both in and for his church. And we've said before, each week, these are seven real live churches that had these real live issues that Jesus is speaking to, and that they really needed to heed the words that he gives them, um, you know, sort of in a local sense. Um, also, though, these, these words also apply to every church all throughout history, corporately. They apply to the greater body of Christ, and they apply to each one of us as Christians individually and personally. And so we've looked so far at three different churches. We looked at Ephesus. We looked at Smyrna. We looked at Pergamos. And this morning we're going to come to number four, which is the letter to the church at Thyatira. And it is both the longest and it's also kind of the most puzzling for many students of the Bible of all of these different letters to the churches. Um, it also is most certainly the most searching and the most stinging of all the letters. So buckle up and kind of we're going to wade into lessons from the church at Thyatira, which we see begins, of course, in verse 18, with a reminder from Jesus. In verse 18, Jesus says to John, he says, To the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. So Thyatira was about 40 miles southeast of of Pergamos, and it was a much smaller city. It's actually both the smallest and the least important of all of these seven different cities that Jesus addresses. So insignificant is this church, they don't even have a cool uh, picture of Thyatira in the history books anywhere. So it's interesting that this church in the smallest city actually gets the longest of the letters to all the churches. Uh, what we're going to see is there's a good reason for that because there were some things going on there in this church that were a very deep concern to the Lord and they needed to be judged 
by the Lord. And we notice right off the bat, he introduces himself here as the one with eyes like a flame of fire and feet like fine brass. Again, pulling this description right from the vision that John described in chapter one, these eyes, right, that looked with a a penetrating kind of a judgment, feet that stood fast, immovable. In that time in the ancient world, brass was the strongest known metal. It would be as if we said today that he had feet of titanium or whatever it is they are building rocket ships out of these days. Um, you know, but brass would have been this pure kind of highly refined metal refined there in the fire. And for the first time and the only time in all of the book of Revelation, Jesus identifies himself here as the son of God rather than as the son of man. And all of this kind of imagery would right off the bat have reminded the Thyatirans that Jesus is nothing less than God and that he has the right to righteously judge what he saw that was going on in that church. So in a very real sense, this church was singled out for this most penetrating letter, the most significant rebuke that we're gonna see. Again, it's ironic that the, the, the city of Thyatira itself was the least significant of all of these cities. It was a city that kind of lay inland, just alongside the road that connected Pergamos with Sardis, went on a little further to Philadelphia and ultimately to Laodicea. So it was this route that would have been crowded with all of the commerce of Asia. And so Thyatira was a commercial city. It wasn't a cultural one at all, but it was commercial in the sense that it wasn't known so much for banking or as a trade center, but more so it was a manufacturing town. It was well known, it was famous for its trade guilds. You had guilds of all different kinds of workers, workers in metals and bronze, right? So this reference here to the feet like fine brass would have really resonated with them. You had workers in pottery and baking and leather, and most of all, you had workers in textiles. So workers of wool, workers of linen, makers of kind of these great outer garments, and you had a great many fabric dyers. We probably could even say safely that Thyatira was the center of a dyeing industry. A dyeing industry? Yeah, so good, you guys are with me. Good, love it. In fact, remember this, it only gets better after this, I promise. Remember in Acts chapter 16, remember when the Apostle Paul was at Philippi, he met Lydia, who was described as a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira. So Lydia was the one who sold this expensive purple fabric that was produced right here by the workers in Thyatira. So we would probably say this was kind of a blue collar, kind of a union sort of a town. And unlike all of the other cities that we've seen so far, unlike Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamos, the city of Thyatira had no special religious significance. It wasn't a known center for either any particular pagan god or the worship of of Caesar. It did, of course, have all of the different little temples to all of the different little gods for the worshiping convenience of the pagans who lived there, but none that were significant enough that it would attract kind of pilgrims or visitors from other areas. And yet, again, to this hardworking town, Jesus is about to deliver his strongest rebuke. And yet he starts it, though, as he has each time, by recognizing the things that they were doing right in his eyes. Look at verse 19. We see his approval of them. In verse 19, he says, I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. And the first thing I love about this verse is that Thyatira indeed may have been the least significant among these seven cities, and yet we see here that what they were doing was not hidden 
to Jesus. Just like all of these bigger churches in these bigger cities, Jesus says the same thing to the church at Thyatira. He says, hey, I know your works. And I think it's such a comfort and it's such an encouragement to remember that no matter where it is that we're laboring, no matter how small our labor might seem, that Jesus sees and he knows how hard we are serving him. And he recognizes that and he appreciates it. And although Jesus is about to deliver this heavy word of rebuke against this church, notice he finds six different areas that he can commend them. He says they had works, love, service, faith, patience. That's five, right? In many ways, this church was a model church. It had a lot going for it. It was a very active church. And the sixth thing, notice Jesus says, not only had they started strong, but that they were continuing even stronger. Unlike the church at Ephesus, who were doing less and less as they grew, right? Not only does the church at Thyatira have these works, but they have these things in increasing measure. They were actually growing in love and service and faith and patience. And that is no small commendation, especially when you consider maybe our own service for the Lord. So often we see, uh, you know, a believer can start out big in something And then yet as the daily demands of life and ministry kind of take its toll, we see people kind of start to fade in their fervor and in their service. But not Thyatira. They were growing and they were active. And yet, even with all of these external appearances of Christian life and testimony, we're going to see that they had some serious internal problems. And that's what Jesus is going to detail next in the next four verses. Now comes his accusation against them. Starting in verse 20, he says, nevertheless, I have a few things against you. And there's that pesky word again, nevertheless. And you could make a star next to that, right? Or a line under it in your Bible, because when Jesus comes to you, especially when he comes to you with eyes of flaming fire, right? And he says, nevertheless, That's the point that you want to sit up and you want to take notice because what he's saying again is despite all of the good, these next things are so bad that the bad outweighs the good. What we want, right, we want people to start listing all of our faults and then say, but you know, despite all of that, I still love you. Or despite all of that, we're going to keep you in this job, right? But Jesus starts with the good. Then he says, nevertheless, I have a few things against you. Continuing in verse 20, he says, because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and beguile my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. So though there are a few things that Jesus had against this church, they all grew from the same root. And the center of the corruption at the church at Thyatira was a woman or a system that Jesus calls Jezebel. Now this may or may not have been an actual individual, and yet this kind of a title would have immediately brought a very strong association to the infamous Jezebel, right? The wicked Queen Jezebel, the wife of King Ahab. We see her story in 1 Kings 16 through 21, again in 2 Kings 10. Ahab and Jezebel's reign over Israel is one of the saddest seasons, probably the saddest season in the history of God's people. Just the name Jezebel would have painted such a powerful picture in the minds of these Christians. It would be not unlike us calling somebody a Judas, right, or a Hitler, right? It would have communicated something strong and something clear, which also is probably another reason why many believe that it's not likely that this woman was an actual woman who was actually named Jezebel, 
because quite honestly, the name Jezebel was probably not in the book of most popular baby names in the first century. Right? That name was destroyed. She was one of the most evil characters in all of the Old Testament. Queen Jezebel was a heathen woman, right? She was the daughter of a Sidonian priest of Baal, right? Baal, the pagan deity of fertility and of provision, considered to be kind of the lord of all of the other, he had conquered all of these other lesser pagan deities. Baal was a cruel, sensuous, revolting false god, the worship of whom involved child sacrifice. It involved sexual degradation and just gross lewdness. And Jezebel promoted the worship of Baal in Israel. In 2 Kings 9, it speaks of the harlotries of your mother Jezebel and her witchcraft, which are so many. So she's guilty of whoredom and witchcraft and idolatry, murder, deceit. And Jesus here accuses this church of following in the footsteps of her wicked example. Now, if by chance the name Jezebel does refer to a real woman who was really living there in Thyatira, then the church was guilty of receiving her personally as a prophetess, right? As one who claimed to speak on behalf of God, and yet Jesus says clearly she wasn't, and she didn't. So at the very least, we could say she's kind of a self-styled prophetess who was leading the people straight into sin, and they were willingly following her. Again, on the outside, right, a model church, works, love, service, patience, faith, and yet there was significant corruption going on inside the church. And so the sin of the, the church as a whole was that they allowed this woman to have this kind of influence and bring this kind of corruption. So the sin of this woman or of this system is that it led others into these sins of sexual immorality and also idolatry. So the Jezebel system in its simplest form is the introduction of false teaching that legitimized full-blown idolatry into the church. And just as we see throughout the Old Testament, right, this reference of Jesus here as he talks about sexual immorality and adultery, it's not speaking purely of a physical, but also more specifically of spiritual fornication. It's the going after other gods but not just instead of, but in addition to the true and living God. And here's what's important to understand. Queen Jezebel was an expert in the art of mixing. And she had very successfully kind of united and blended the existing religions of Israel with this new pagan influences that she brought with her from Phoenicia. When she first came from Sidon, she brought with her her own gods. She then caused her husband, King Ahab, to start worshiping Baal. But understand, it wasn't because she wanted to banish the worship of Jehovah. She just wanted to kind of add in or mix in the worship of Baal through this idolatry and this immorality in addition to worshiping Jehovah. And that's important because all of this means that this Jezebel of Thyatira, whether she was a real woman or just that same heresy that we see from Queen Jezebel, there's this evil influence on the life and the worship of the church, but not to destroy the church, but to transform the church kind of from the inside out through the adding of all of these pagan influences. And the situation there economically in Thyatira was ripe for this kind of destructive teaching spiritually. Because what you had was all of these trade workers, right? These Christians who are these trade workers who needed to be members of these different trade guilds in order to survive just so they could practice their trades, just so they could earn a living. However, each trade guild 
had its own patron deity of that guild that all came from this big kind of pantheon of Greek and Roman gods. And the focus of the guilds was these frequent kind of get-togethers. They were these common meals, sort of like a, a banquet, and they were held, you guessed it, right in the temple of the god who was over that guild. They always involved some sort of sacrifice to that god and then a feasting on the meat of the sacrifice before the whole deal ultimately sort of degraded into a drunken, let's just say a group expression of sexual immorality. And that's sort of putting it nicely for a Sunday morning. So as a Christian, you were stuck because if you refused to join the union, you couldn't work. But if you did, you were not only compromising your own faith, but you were destroying your own testimony. And not because eating the sacrificed meat meant anything, because Paul had already addressed this years ago, back when he wrote to the church at Corinth. He says, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world. We know there's only one God, no other God but one. He says, hey, since you know that these idols have no power, go ahead and eat whatever you want. But then if you read the rest of that chapter, he goes on to explain that the real problem is what you are demonstrating to the people around you, to the unbelievers around you, when they see you eating that same meat that they know had been sacrificed to an idol, they say, hey, those people are no different than we are. They're eating the very same things that we're eating. They're worshiping the idol like we're worshiping the idol by eating this meat, and yet they claim that they serve this sort of exclusive holy God. And yet now in comes Jezebel to the rescue with a very kind of a strong movement and a very attractive teaching that it was perfectly fine for you to participate in these things. After all, you got to work, right? In fact, she may have even claimed that by adding these practices and these idols, it would actually enhance your worship and your witness. So it was basically the next step from the doctrine of Balaam that we saw at Pergamos that allowed for compromise it allowed for idolatry, it allowed for sexual immorality, but this now incorporated it through a very specific teaching. And I love the way one author put it perfectly. He said, if the church at Pergamos is an example of the compromising church that is taking the first kiss towards sin, then the church of Thyatira is the church that has completely gone to bed with idolatry and is suffering the life-threatening side effects of immorality. Just like we saw with the original Jezebel in the days of the kingdom of Israel. And we know that because these things took place there in that Old Testament Israel, they were rejected by God. Now we have this New Testament church headed down the very same road, making the very same mistakes that Israel had made. But we need to be clear, because errors in practice, errors in conduct within the church, they always begin with errors in teaching and errors in the instruction of the church. Notice, again, Jesus' accusation that here's this false prophetess that is using false teaching to seduce or to deceive, to beguile God's people. Effectively, through her teaching, she was giving them a license to sin. And Peter speaks so strongly about this. In 2 Peter chapter 2, he says, but there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. Then further on down the chapter, he says, For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through lewdness, 
the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. If you get a chance, read the whole thing. It, it's a powerful, don't read it right now, but read it when you get home, right? It's a, powerful, it's a powerful passage from a very powerful chapter. And this is the essence of how terrible the sin of Jezebel was. Because notice Jesus said that she was corrupting the servants of Jesus. And the servants of Jesus belong to Jesus. That is a pretty heavy reality. It's like Jesus said in Mark chapter 9, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Did you guys catch that one? A heavy reality, a millstone, heavy. Did you guys get that? Okay, I'm just trying to lighten up the mood a little bit, right? Lighten the mood on this heavy subject. I'm getting the ax over there, the hook. It is heavy, right? Later in the letter in verse 24, Jesus tells us, he kind of gives us a sense of the depth of the sin. He says that the doctrine had led people to discover the depths of Satan. Now, some believe this is a reference to kind of the esoteric mysteries of these false kind of Babylonian cult religions. Others think it's a, a reference to the Gnostic heresy where they always talked about there's a, a deeper knowledge of kind of mysteries of the cosmos, right? Or a heresy at that time that was actually popular that said that it was a duty to experience every kind of sin that you possibly could because you were trying to allow the body to wallow in sin and yet keep your soul unaffected. Now, it's very likely, I think, that the sin of Jezebel was a nice blending of all of these things, right? Telling that basically that a Christian ought to just accommodate themselves to the world, right? Leading the church into both a physical and a spiritual wickedness and a lewdness. And eventually, if that had been allowed to happen, the church would have become nothing more than what I loved. One author called a kind of a pleasant paganism. And I'm afraid if we look around, we do see that happening increasingly in the church today. We have preachers preaching. We even have teachers teaching. their are false doctrines that are so skillfully intermixed with the true ones. We have blind, misled Christians who are singing and praising the Lord each and every Sunday, sitting in churches that are enslaved by false doctrine. And they are loving every minute of it. Because what they're being taught is, you can have it all. You deserve it all. God wants you to have it all. Right? You can worship Baal, and you can still worship Jehovah. Now, nobody has a little idol to Baal in their, in their room, right? And yet it's probably sitting in the driveway. It's probably sitting tied to a dock somewhere or sitting up in a beautiful snow-filled mountain somewhere. You can have it all, right? It's okay as long as you're in love with that person. God knows your heart, right? It's your body, right? It's your choice. Or if it feels right, it must be right. There's no talk of self-denial. There's no self-examination. But instead, it's all about self-actualization and self-care and self-esteem, right? And so we have Christians running from church to church Sunday after Sunday because their ears are always itching to hear something that's soothing and something that's pleasing that feeds that flesh, either from their pastor or some other self-styled prophetess of daytime TV. And I will be honest. If you leave here week after week just feeling so great about yourself, then I'm probably not doing a very good job. But if you leave here each week feeling great about Jesus, then I'm probably doing okay. 
Because the thing I think that we see that's super significant about this church here at Thyatira is that we don't see any sign that this church suffered at all from any type of persecution for their faith. There's no mention of any kind of tribulation that they were experiencing because of their faith, most likely because they'd become just like the world. They had embraced kind of the prevailing mindset of the world. They had abandoned the idea of absolute truth like the world. They'd adopted a kind of a moral relativism just like the world. They'd stopped calling sin, sin like the world. They had compromised on these once tightly held convictions, probably for the sake of trying to fit in with the world, and ultimately they had failed to take a stand for truth in the world, right? It was all Jezebel all the time. When what Paul had said is that we needed to be not conformed to this world but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. To Timothy, he wrote that we needed to guard what was committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings, the contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge, because by professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. And if we're not careful, we can all end up in the same danger of doing the very same thing as Tyra was doing, simply tolerating a bunch of ridiculous beliefs because just like Thyatira, we are too afraid or we're too loving or we're too tolerant to just speak the truth. We're afraid we might lose our friends or be singled out or seem narrow. And so what happens is so many Christians just sit idly by and they allow this ignorance or they allow this heresy to come into the church. And the truth of the matter is the old choice is still the new choice. And that's choose this day whom you will serve. And Jezebel and those that she was leading into the sin, they had made their choice. And yet notice what Jesus adds in verse 21 as she kind of adds to her resume of sin against him. He says in verse 21, and I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality and she did not repent. So the real tragedy here of, of Jezebel, if she's a real person, those who were following his, her teachings, is that they absolutely would not repent. They did not repent, even though Jesus gave them the opportunity to do it. And this, I think, is actually Jesus' greatest accusation against her and against them. They had completely and apparently rejected the work of the Holy Spirit in their hearts as he was calling them to repentance. But I think this verse is such a great reminder of the grace of Jesus, because no matter what we may think of as we look at an individual or a group or a church, and we come to the conclusion that they couldn't possibly repent, Jesus is always looking for repentance from even the worst cases. He's looking for repentance and for return to the Lord. He said he was gonna give them time to repent but we also are about to see it's not going to be unlimited time. There is a time when God says, we just read it as we read through Genesis, right? During the days of Noah, he said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever. And just, you know, as a personal note, when God gives us time to repent and when he speaks to our hearts through the conviction and the ministry of the spirit as he calls us to repent, we need to take advantage of that time that we've been given and we need to respond to that ministry because what we see throughout the scriptures and what we're gonna see next here from Jezebel and her followers is that continued rejection always will bring sudden judgment. Look at verses 22 and 23, he says, "'Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed "'and those who commit adultery with her "'into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds, and I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Did you notice that even in his judgment, Jesus is looking for real repentance? 
Right? This church, these followers may not have endured tribulation from the world, but they would endure it instead at the hands of Jesus, but because he wanted to drive them to turn back to him. One of the things I love in this letter is that before Jesus even tells the Christians in Thyatira what they need to do, he tells them first what he's about to do. He's going to chastise Jezebel and cast her into a sick bed, right, along with those who are committing adultery with her. Now, this reference to a sick bed, it could simply be an image of affliction that was going to come upon them, or it could be a literal sickness that Jesus was going to allow into the lives of Jezebel and her followers as a form of, of chastisement. But the real point here is the purpose of the chastening. Again, it's to draw them to repent of their deeds. They wouldn't listen before, so now Jesus had to speak a little bit louder to them. And I know none of you have ever experienced anything like that. Right? In Hebrews chapter 12, we're promised that whom the Lord loves, he what? He chastens. And take it from me, so often, the most loving thing that the Lord can do to us is to discipline us. It, it always stings now, but we will always bless him for it later. Because that discipline, what it so often does is it forms in us a depth of love and an appreciation for his correction that is priceless. And yet when we refuse even that kind of gentle hand of correction, what we do is we force him to bring judgment down upon us that then serves as evidence of his holiness to everybody around us. Notice, he says that when he does bring this judgment, he says, all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. When we see someone in the body of Christ, whether it's someone that we know personally or someone who we only know you know, because of their celebrity, when we see them experience some sort of judgment from the Lord because of their sin, we don't sit back and say, oh boy, I'm glad he got what was coming to him. What happens instead is it puts us on our own face before the Lord. Because we look at that and we're so thankful for God's continued grace in our own lives. And we have this sort of refreshed sense and an appreciation for his holiness. We always need to remember the Lord doesn't punish us just to punish us. He always has a purpose in it. And that purpose always is both for our good and for his glory. Now, for you prophecy buffs, make a note. Some people see in this verse a picture of the fact that part of the professing church, right, those who profess a faith in Jesus, but who don't really have a relationship with Jesus, that those people will be left on the earth to face judgment during the great tribulation. Notice that part of the promise here is that he would kill her children with death. So there's a sense there that this suffering would extend also to her followers. Now, I want to say this as graciously as I can. Historically, many students of the Bible believe that this church here at Thyatira represents the next season in church history, right? Beginning in about the seventh century. All right? It was a season where we saw something that was a far cry from the simplicity of early Christianity. We start to see the rise of a very powerful and a false church system that incorporated the adoration of images, right? We started to see the sale of indulgences, the practice of priestly absolution from these very sins like fornication. All of this as we start to see the centralization of power and authority within the church centered in Rome the dominance, of course, of Romanism or of Roman Catholicism. Now, the painful parallels between the church at Thyatira and the Roman Catholic Church throughout history are painfully clear. 
Because what has happened is that the state church that we saw established under Constantine started to become very, very accommodating in the fourth and the fifth and the sixth centuries. The church continued to compromise its convictions with the increasing addition of all these different sort of heathen rites and rituals, these different heathen ceremonies. And what they were trying to do was they were trying to make Christianity more palatable and more acceptable, more attractive to all of the pagan people within the Roman Empire who were being forced to adopt this religion. But they did it to such a degree that by the time you get to the seventh century, you could walk in and you could hardly tell whether you were in a Christian church or in a pagan temple. There were idols everywhere, images everywhere. And we started to see all of these very strange sort of cultic pagan ritual elements that had been added into the Christian worship. Some students of the Bible see kind of the prominence of Jezebel as a woman prophetess is compared to what we see as this unscriptural kind of exaltation of the Virgin Mary within the Catholic Church. She's presented as a, a co-redemptrix with Christ, kind of a mediator between Christ and his people. The name Thyatira itself comes from two different words. The first means a sacrifice or an incense offering, and the other word means that which goes on continually. So the literal interpretation of the name Thyatira is continual sacrifice. And for any of you that know anything about the heart of Catholic theology, it's based upon what they call the sacrifice of the Mass, which is the priests declare that in the Mass, they are actually offering a continual sacrifice for the sins of the living and the dead, and that each time they celebrate the Lord's Supper in every Mass, that it is the literal body and the blood of Jesus Christ, and therefore it is another actual sacrifice of Jesus for our sins. And that it's this continuous sacrifice of Christ, that's what brings the grace, that's what brings the salvation. And what's unfortunate is that is in direct contrast to what the Bible teaches. To the Hebrews, it was explained that Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Contrary to what Jesus himself declared from the cross when he cried out, it is finished. The price was paid, the work was done, and there is no reason to lead sincere believers into the understanding that they are now somehow dependent upon the church to dispense grace through the mass that Jesus already gave us through the cross once and for all. Some have even seen that the, the references here in, in Thyatira to this participation in these idolatrous feasts, that that's an illustration of this kind of a skewed sacrifice of the mass. Interestingly, the Greek word there that Jesus uses for sickbed in verse 22 is the same word for a banqueting couch. And so if you take that, then the rendering literally would be, I will strike her down as she sits at her forbidden feasts. Now historically, in church history, we see that Rome was given the time, was given the opportunity to repent of her doctrinal errors. We think about all of the mighty reformers, right? We think of uh, Savonarella in Italy and Wycliffe and Cremner in England, Knox in Scotland and Luther in Germany, Zwingli in Switzerland, Calvin in France. All of these faithful servants that God raised up through the church through the years, all leading up to the Protestant Reformation, pointing out the error of Rome and calling Rome to repent of her iniquity, and yet she repented not. And yet I want to say this, as we look at this letter, 
you've already seen that Jesus gives Rome credit for a great deal that is good. Remember, works, love, service, faith, patience, and as for your works, the last are more than the first. And we remember from the seventh century all the way up to today, there has been such a great deal done in the way of good works in and from the Roman Catholic Church that absolutely cannot be overlooked. Nuns and monks who've been ready and willing and laid down their lives for the needy and for the sick, a time when every hospital in all of Western Europe was simply a Roman Catholic monastery or a convent. And the Lord doesn't forget all of that. Right? Where there is even the smallest bit of faith, his love takes note of all of it. And so I want you to hear me, right? Even in the face of, even in spite of the doctrinal error or even the, the apostasy that's at the root of Roman Catholicism, there are churches, just like the church at Thyatira, there are churches where there are sincere believers and there are true servants and there are loving ministers who have not bought into all the wickedness and the deception of this wicked Jezebel who truly do love the Lord Jesus Christ, who really do know him as their savior. And next we're gonna see Jesus' admonition to them. To those people in verse 24, he says, but to you I say, and the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine and who have not known the depths of Satan, as they call them, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. So after this strong condemnation, Jesus now ends with this beautiful word of exhortation, right? To this godly remnant who's still there in the church of Thyatira. And on this remnant, right? Those who hadn't bought into this doctrinal deception and all this Jezebel stuff and the depths of Satan to him, he imposed one simple instruction and that was to hold fast what you have until I come. They had to continue holding on to what was good. They couldn't become distracted or discouraged from what Jesus had already want, wanted and called them to do, right? They had to cling tightly, cling fiercely to what he had given them. They just had to hold fast. And we see this language all throughout the Bible. Right, simply right to cling to or to take a firm grasp. The first time we see it is in Deuteronomy 10, and it was given to Israel with the tablets there on Mount Sinai. It says, fear the Lord and serve him, hold fast to him, and take your oaths in his name. And then it was given at the end of their wandering in the wilderness, when they entered into the promised land, right? So once at the beginning, once at the end of their wilderness time, in Joshua 22, it says, be very careful to keep the commandment, the law of Moses, the servant of the Lord gave you. Love the Lord your God, walk in obedience to him, keep his commandments to hold fast to him and to serve him with all of your heart and all of your soul. We see the apostle Paul also use this frequently in his writings. So holding fast to the Lord, right? Loving him with our whole being, following him closely, obeying his word diligently, right? Devoting ourselves to him wholly, serving him with all of our heart and all of our mind and all of our soul and staying steadfastly connected to him no matter what it is that might come our way. It's a term that sailors have used and they used it in the context kind of of holding on securely to the ship's ropes and the ship's rigging in the midst of a severe storm. And there's a sense that's understood amongst sailors that when you are on deck and you are fighting through the worst of these storms, you know, the life-threatening kind of the worst of storms, where each wave threatens to throw you overboard kind of storms, that in those kind of storms, that you dedicate one hand for the ship and one hand 
for yourself. And the idea here being that in order to help your crew, you have to make sure that you're taken care of, right? If you get washed overboard, you're no good to anyone. And because of that, you always secure your one hand to the ship. You actually lash it to the ship. And then once you're secured and ready to take on these waves, now you can use the other hand to help yourself and to help the rest of the crew. That that working hand can be used to now help ensure that that ship and its cargo and its crew and its passengers, that you make it safely through the storm, but only because you are holding fast to the Lord and to his word with the other hand. There's so much each and every day that threatens, doesn't it, to wash us overboard or to throw us off course unless we are holding fast, lashed to Jesus, right? Not compromising in our commitment, not allowing ourselves to be kind of washed away by the allure of false teaching. That teaching that would give us permission to compromise in the purity of our faith just for the sake of kind of getting on a little bit more easily. There's such a deep deception in that. Because the Bible says that in holding fast, there's a promise of life. In Proverbs it says, let your heart hold fast to my words, keep my commandments, and live. So there's this call to doctrinal purity, right? This maintaining the simplicity of the gospel. Don't be perverted. Don't be diverted by the teachings of man, by the teachings of the church, by the culture, by the world. Cling to the Lord, right? And that's the way that we receive power and direction. Now, we can ask the question, okay, Lord, but how long? How long do I have to do this? How long do I, how long can I keep this up? How long can I keep holding fast? Well, what does Jesus tell us there? Until he comes. Until he returns for us or until we return to him. But until then, he says, you got to hold fast. And here was this exhortation to the overcomers. Hold on, he says, but I'm going to get there. And the Son of God is coming with those eyes like flaming fire, those feet like fine brass, and then the judgment's going to come. And I know there's times when it seems like we're not going to make it, and we can't take much more, we can't hold on much longer, and like the increasing waves, right, of wickedness and all of the deception that we see, and yet Jesus says we simply need to hang in there, stand strong for him, stand strong in him until he comes, because only then will the battle be over. And to the, to the faithful, right, we finish off with this assurance we see in verse 26, he says that he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule with them with a rod, he shall rule them, pardon me, with a rod of iron, as the potter's vessel shall be broken to pieces, as I also have received from my father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. What an encouragement here, right? Even when there's all of this immoral, idolatrous influence of this Jezebel, the reminder here from Jesus is that we can, as his followers, overcome. We can keep his works until the end. Right? It's sometimes hard, but we can't be dis overly discouraged by all of the immorality that's around us. Instead, we need to trust that God's work is still going on through the overcomers, that ultimately Jesus will have the victory, and that he's going to share in that victory even with us. Right? Those who overcome the threat of immorality and and idolatry, Jesus offers a share of nothing less than his own kingdom. Now, of course, prophetically, this is this promise that the believers who are faithful, we're going to join him in his millennial reign of righteousness. And imagine what Jesus, including this hope here, to the faithful Christians in Thyatira, 
Imagine how overwhelmed they were with the immorality and the idolatry that was all around them. And so Jesus reminds them, just like he would remind some of us this morning, you are on my winning team. And yet this morning as we close, and I promise we are going to close, it's so awesome just to sit and we kind of ponder the wonders of what it's going to be like to rule and reign with Jesus, right? You know, we're all going to be over a city and, you know, we hope we get a good one, right? Not some lame city to rule over. I'm not going to mention any of those lame cities. They're all going to be different at that point. California is going to fall into the ocean, I'm sure. So, so Nevada will probably be coastal at that point, Duarte's. But I want to close with this. There's one other reward that Jesus promises that's going to be ours even here and now. Because look at verse 28. Jesus offers this one reward that's even greater than anything that could come in the kingdom. Because he says that to the one who will overcome the immorality and the idolatry, what does he say? I will give him the morning star. So Jesus offers us the reward of himself. Because we're going to see in Revelation chapter 22 that he is the morning star. And how often is it that the enemy tries to get us to satisfy ourselves and to to fill our hearts just settling for these pleasures that this present life has to offer, right? All of the different immorality and the idolatry and the Jezebel, you know, of this present world, when our creator himself, he knows us, he loves us, and here he's reminding us that the only thing that will truly satisfy us, the only true eternal reward, and the only true present fulfillment is him. See, so Jezebel says, hey, you can have it all. You can have all that the world has to offer. But Jesus says you can have better. Because you can have all of me, he says. Amen? Amen. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, for this morning. And we thank you for um, this chapter, Lord. It's a, a difficult chapter, Father. We pray that you would... Help to minister the truths, Lord, of your word into our hearts, Lord. Help uh, give us direction and instruction, Lord, what it is that we're to do with it, Lord, how we're to respond to it. Um, Father, we thank you for the encouragement, but we also thank you for the way that it searches us, Lord. Um, Any of those areas where we have maybe unknowingly, Lord, or even willingly, we're following after some sort of a false teaching, Lord, from that Jezebel system. And so we pray, Lord, that you'd search our hearts, pray that you'd speak to us about these things, Lord, and lead us um, to repentance over them. And so we thank you, Lord, and we praise you, and we pray that you'd be with us now as we worship you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's uh, worship the